Our next speaker is uh, Brendan Nidus. Um, Brendan started as an intern with Microtrace, analyzing paint by um, or paint pigments by Raman spectroscopy. Uh, Brendan then earned his degree in chemistry from the University of Wisconsin in Playetteville. Um, currently, Brendan is a microscopist at Microtrace in Elgin, Elgin, Illinois, and his paper today is entitled "Forensic Application of Raman Microspectroscopy," with an emphasis on in situ pigment identification. Thank you. Before I start, my colleague Chris Palinick would like to say a few words about Raman spectroscopy. Hi. First, I just want to thank um, the steering committee for the chance to talk at this um, presentation in front of all of our colleagues here. Um, Brendan's talk is entitled Forensic Applications of Raman Spectroscopy with an emphasis on in situ pigment identification, but actually the emphasis is actually it's all talking about in situ pigment identification. It's not an emphasis. So I just wanted to talk, since so many labs are now starting to look at Raman spectroscopy as a viable forensic technique, um, I wanted to just mention real quickly some of the other ways in which we can use Raman spectroscopy in our laboratory um, and that we found over the last four years um, to be of a lot of use. And while pigments are certainly a really great thing to study by Raman spectroscopy because of the benefits that Raman gives you, um, we found that for general unknowns, Raman spectroscopy is a really powerful tool. Um, where, where IR for a lot of um, inorganic compounds um, has its shortcomings, we've, before Raman spectroscopy, we worked with uh, zero background holders and x-ray diffraction trying to do smaller and smaller um, particles um, with a powder diffractometer. We found that Raman spectroscopy is actually a great tool for doing phase identification of general unknowns, and we've applied it to virtually every sample that comes through our lab, and we've had a lot of real good success either confirming other types of analyses um, and showing that Raman can do it by itself in a lot of cases. And in many cases, because you have such a small spot size, you can actually um, analyze particles that are smaller than what you could see by IR. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, the other point is surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, SIRS, is mainly a research technique right now, but something that I think you should all keep your eyes out for because especially when it comes to looking at dyes, um, it's, it's looking like um, in our lab and other labs that are doing this research um, and that are beyond us in the research that, that we've done, but in our lab alone, we've, we've seen that uh, SIRS looks like it's going to be a real promising technique, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, with regards to pigments, remember that Brendan's talking about automotive paints, but pigments come in virtually any type of coating, and also even in fibers, solution dyed fibers. So Raman spectroscopy offers a way to look at pigments and other things besides paints, which is where you normally think of them. Um, finally, Brendan's going to be talking about the in situ analysis, showing you that this actually works. But his research um, and the, the information he's going to be talking about today is really based, um, is supported by a lot of other research we've done and other groups have done. Um, building Raman databases of automotive and other types of pigments that form uh, support for, for actually looking at some of these things. And so um, we're getting to the point with our characterization of about 200 different organic pigments that we've looked at by Raman spectroscopy of starting to be able to look at pigments and characterize the pigment um, in, or without having a database actually being able to group the pigment by chemical class. Um, and then we're, we've also done work with tinting pigments for architectural paints in looking at the, pigment, the paints that, or the uh, tinting pigments that are actually used to color architectural paints and, and see what those discrete pigments are. And Brendan's going to go into more detail about the actual analysis of paints themselves. Finally, I want to say that we're not do the only people doing this research. There are other groups, um, James Martin, Genevieve Massonet, um, Patrick Buzzini, Ed Suzuki, just to name a few. I know there are others that I'm missing. So. Um, I just want to give credit to other people who are doing this research as well. So now Brendan will uh, talk about the actual in situ analysis. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chris. Go a little overview on the talk. Uh, we'll start out talking about a little bit about Raman spectroscopy, go into our database and talk about our building of our database of different pigments and other compounds. And then most of the talk will be on in situ identification of pigments, going from printing pigments to architectural, which is seen in casework, 
and automotive pigments, which is the most prevalent thing seen in casework. Raman spectroscopy. <clears throat> the advantages to Raman spectroscopy, one of the big advantages is a small analysis volume. You're able to focus on a, a size of about two to three microns, a size area about two to three microns, and using the different parts, different abilities of the Raman spectrometer, especially the confocal with the apertures, you're able to focus on very small areas, which is great for pigment identification because pigments are small and are usually hard to isolate. So in situ identification is possible with a small analysis volume. Also, you're able to do mapping. Mapping is great because you're able to designate an area and set the spectrometer to analyze that area and see the different constituents in that area. Also, you're able to do depth profiling, which you're basically able to look through different layers of a substance and see what other components are in there. And the best part about Raman spectroscopy, I think, is the in situ analysis. You're able to take a sample with limited or no sample preparation and identify pigments and other constituents, fillers, r relatively easily. Also, phase identification is a great advantage to Raman spectroscopy. A classic example is the different polymorphs of titanium dioxide. Uh, you're able to differentiate between rutile and anatase rel actually really easily uh, by Raman spectroscopy. Some of the disadvantages to Raman spectroscopy, one is the fluorescence. Uh, because you're using a monochromatic laser, some of the pigments and dyes absorb that laser and create a fluorescence and block out some of the peaks of the Raman spectrum. Also, we've learned through our research that some strong scatterers can dominate the spectrum. And a good example is copper thalocyanine pigment. It's a very good Raman scatterer and can block out minor pigments or other pigments in a paint, even if you're focusing on that. The, the pigment particle you want to identify, sometimes the pigments around it will, uh, the blue pigments around it will end up scattering stronger than the actual other pigment. A uh, little bit about our instrument. Our instrument is a Renishaw and Via Raman microscope. We have two different lasers. We have a 785 near IR red laser, which is used for most of our analyses. And then we'll also, we have a 514 green laser. And the reason we have two lasers is to el hopefully eliminate uh, possible fluorescence and fluorescent spectrums. Uh, we haven't really crunched the statistics, but uh, about 80 to 90 percent of the pigments that we have run so far have uh, been able to be identified by the 785 laser. And about half of those um, can be identified it, with the 514 laser. Also a nice advantage to the our instrument is we do have a dry 100 times objective, which is we're able to look at very small particles and in this case look at pigments relatively easily. Uh, go on to our Raman library. Uh, our Raman our library, we, we're creating it because uh, Raman libraries aren't as prevalent as IR databases, especially when we started this research about four years ago, they weren't as prevalent. Now with the work of other groups, uh, they, ha they have become more prevalent, but not as prevalent as IR databases. Our database includes pigments, dyes, minerals, and other chemical compounds. It includes over 200 pigments at this point. Um, in our physical reference database, which we have at Microtrace, we have around 500 pigments and about 2,000 dyes that we're going to try to add to that Raman database. It can also be searched, and we can use, it, use the search algorithms to search it against unknown spectra and compare them. Uh, one problem with the searching mechanism, though, is the background base and baseline corrections. These are done basically manually by the, the person analyzing the pigment and can cause problems with the searching. So one way we can try to allevi alleviate this is we save both the background or the baseline corrected spectrum and the, the raw spectrum as well. Uh, moving on to print pigmented uh, printing inks. This is a great starting point because pigmented printing inks, there's uh, very few colors used for pigmented printing inks, or very few pigments, actually. It's a very constrained area. Uh, by the printing pigments, I'm talking about the four-color printing process. We're talking about packaging, letterhead, laser printers, and commercial printing. Uh, also, the samples are readily available, and 
also we can study individual pigments and overlapping pigments as well, or mixtures. Uh, the CMKY printing process, the four color printing process, includes cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, they're applied separately and then registered. The overlapping spots, so if you have yellow and blue, the overlapping spots create the green colors in the printing. So the first uh, thing we studied was a package of bandages at, at our office, actually. It was readily available. We took a section. As you can see, we took a section of the image of, uh, of, the, of the bandage image, and you can see on the right side, that's the uh, microscopic view of the printing. The first pigment identified was the red ink, and this was identified as pigment red 57, or PR 57. This de designation is from the color index, which is, I'd like to say, the Bible on in pigments. Um, nowadays, they're not, not all pigments are in it, but it's a good way to find out the chemical compounds of pigments, find out uh, different chemical characteristics, possible um, other uh, brand names, th those sort of things. We also were able to identify calcite in this Raman spectrum. The calcite is from the paper. The blue pigment was identified as pigment blue 15, and this is the th thalocyanine blue pigment. And the yellow pigment was identified as PY 12 or 13. At this point, we're not able to differentiate between 12 and 13. And also, the calcite was identified in this spectrum as well. That, that is from the paper once again. Now, we did some research, and there is some standardization of the CMKY printing pigments. Uh, the standardization helps for simplicity in printing, um, consistency in printing, cost, and uh, the yellow was, we found out, was diarylide yellow triple A or pigment yellow 12. The, the magenta was found out to be lith lithanol rubine, which is pigment red 57-1. And the cyan was uh, found out to be thalocyanine blue GS, which is pigment blue 15-3. And black was carbon black. The next sample we looked at, we looked at another, uh, it's just a food label that we had around the la lab. And it, as you can see, the, the zoomed in area of the printing area, of the printing inks, pigments. And the blue, once again, was identified as thalocyanine blue and consistent with the uh, standard pigments. The red, once again, was identified as pigment red 57, and there was also some calcite found, which is due to the paper, once again. And the yellow pigment was actually found to be pigment. PY-17, which is different from the PY-12 that was the standardized. So this kind of shows that not always will you, even if you find a standardized set of pigments, will you find the actual standard uh, pigments in a sample, which can differentiate it or be able to compare an unknown to a uh, control relatively nicely. Moving on to Raman component maps. Now this is a, a printing, a map of uh, these Four, four color printing inks, and you can see that the blue is on the left, and that is the map of the blue area where the blue pigments are. The red is in the middle, and the green is on the right. And as, as you can see here, even though they are overlapping, we're able to map the areas where these pigments are, are in the, that designated area. To wrap up printing pigments, um, multiple pigments were identified, even pigments that weren't the standard pigments. Also, the pigments were identified in situ. We basically, there was no sample preparation. We stuck it under the Raman microscope. Um, we traditionally put our samples on polished aluminum slides and look at them under the Raman microscope in situ. Moving on to architectural paints. These are counter, countered a little bit more in case work. Um, this is a great stepping stone from printing inks to um, architectural paints because there's also a limited number of pigments used in this case. Also, the samples are readily available. In this study, we, uh, the actually containers had some pigments listed on the side of the containers, and seven paints were analyzed in this study. And the paint analyzed was glidden latex gloss enamel paint, and the ingredients listed on the side of the can or the pigments actually were as follows. The black paint had carbon black in it. The gray paint had 
pigment green seven and titanium dioxide. The red paint had pigment red three. The blue paint had titanium dioxide. The green paint had pigment yellow iron oxide. And the white paint had aluminum sodium salt listed, quartz, and titanium dioxide. There was also brown paint analyzed, but it did not have pigments listed on the label. So the black paint, uh, we identified the carbon black as it said on the label. And as you can see, this is the characteristic uh, carbon black spectrum. It has two broad peaks. And before you saw the spectra of different pigments, and those were more sharp, pe sharp peaks. The green paint, we identified uh, two pigments. We identified the, the PY42, or the yellow iron oxide, and we also identified the PB15 pigment. And as you can see, this is a great example of how one pigment can dominate uh, a Raman spectrum. The only peak you can really see from the yellow iron oxide is around 390 wave numbers, and that's the main peak of the iron oxide. The rest of the spectrum is basically the thylacinine blue pigment. And also the, the blue pigment was not listed on the label, and we identified that. The brown paint, which didn't have pigments listed on the label, had carbon black identified and also a filler mica. There also are some other peaks there. However, we did not identify them at the time of the analysis. The gray paint, we identified the PG7, which is a halogenated thylacinine pigment. We also identified the phase of titanium dioxide, which was rutile. And uh, as you can see in the spectrum, there's a slight hint of carbon black also in the, um, in the paint spectrum. The blue paint, we identified uh, PB15 once again. This was actually not on the label. We, however, we weren't able to identify the um, titanium dioxide in this, in this paint, which was on the label. And it shows how some, some pigments actually dominate the spectrum, once again, and the thylacinine blue pigment did dominate the spectrum. The red paint was identified as PR3, as it said on the label. And the white paint was identified as rutile, the phase of titanium dioxide. To wrap up architectural pa paints, uh, there are seven paints analyzed. Uh, the major pigments in most of the paints were identified. Some of the fillers were also identified, like mica. Uh, pigments listed on the can, uh, most notably the thylacinine pigment was identified. And in some cases, multiple paints were identified. Once again, all these paints were identified in situ and under the Raman microscope. Moving on to in situ analysis of automotive paints. Uh, this case, there's limited or no sample prep once again. Uh, basically, in situ analysis would allow us to reliably, reliably as we've shown before, ID pigments. And we want to know what, what could we learn from automotive pigments and automotive paints, because automotive paints are such a broad area. There's so many pigments in there. Can we find out just the major pigments, or can we find the minor pigments as well, or, or more of the minor pigments? And for this sample set, we had 27 CTS paint samples. These were provided by Scott Ryland. Our emphasis was on the red and the brown paints because these are harder to examine. They usually absorb the laser and you get a fluorescence or fluorescence in the spectrum and it's harder to get resolved the peaks from that. Also, um, some of the pigment names were supplied by CTS, so we compared what we found to the CTS uh, analyzed pigments that they found. Also, um, we analyzed all the paints and compared them to our Raman database. And at the time, our Raman database included around 100 pigments, and not all those pigments were automotive pigments. The first paint was a blue paint. We had one sample of blue paint. This was identified as a caprothylocyanine pigment by CTS, and we also identified this at, as caprothylocyanine and, and had rutile in it as well. The yellow paints, I am not going to go through all this, but basically, as you can see on the left side, the known components uh, supplied by CTS are listed, and the ones we found are listed on the right. And sometimes you can see that we did not identify the main pigment, most likely, be, well, likely because we did not have that reference spectrum. Other times we did, were able to identify more than one pigment, um, 
And most notably in, in number seven, we were able to identify uh, two other pigments in the, in the sample, and uh, especially PG36, which is another halogenated thalocyanine, which is kind of unique compared to what CTS found. Moving on to red paints, um, once again, I'm not gonna go through all these. However, um, the most notable area you can see is number seven, which we identified all four pigments, and these were done in situ. And we were able to identify all four of them, which was, um, which was actually pretty, pretty neat. Um, also, we were able to identify at least one, two, or three different pigments in the other samples here as well. Going on to these, we were able to identify, um, once again, one, two, or three pigments in most of the samples. Sample number 10 is what we would have expected for most of the samples initially. We, had, we did, were not able to identify any of the four pigments, and fluorescence was a big problem with, with these. And the third page of red paints, you can see that we identified once again one, two, or three different pigments in each sample. So the summary of auto paints, out of the 26 yellow and red paints we studied, 15 different pigments were identified in situ. Uh, based on our database at the time, like I said, uh, we had about 100 pigments. Now we have over 200 pigments. Not all the pigments in the database were automotive pigments. Um, and several pigments were identified in each paint, or multiple paints. And the biggest feat was we identified up to four pigments in one sample in situ. And to summarize Raman spectroscopy, Raman has been proven, has potential to be extremely valuable um, as identifying pigments in situ. Um, this, we don't propose this as a, as a solution or a, a, a tool to take over the rest of the stuff that you use in your lab. This is just an additional tool and that can help identify pigments, especially paint pigments. Um, it's valuable in identifying other types of materials as well. We found it's, it, it's able to identify minerals and phases of minerals if we have a small amount and not able to run X-ray diffraction. Uh, currently our database includes over 200 pigments and we are working on, like Chris said, a general, general classification scheme of pigments and going through um, organic pigments and trying to classify them through a, basically a flow chart. And also we're focusing on minor pigments, trying to identify those as well. I'd like to thank the Microtrace staff for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Also, um, Heidi, who is one of, was one of our interns last summer, she might be in the audience this morning, and she helped out with some of this research, and Scott Ryland for, his, for supplying us with the CTS paint samples. Is there any questions? <laughs> Who? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> what? Oh, what objective? Um, I, for most of my research, I actually, I remember I used about the, the 50 times, but however, if we wanted to focus in on a certain small clump of pigments, um, 100 was very helpful as well. Hi, I'm, I'm Ed Bartok from Suffolk University. Question I have is, did you experience any uh, burning properties when you were looking at carbon black? And if so, wh what did you do to overcome that? As well as, in addition, some of the, I, I've experienced that with other, other uh, paints as well. Mm -hmm. um, usually what I did was I started off, uh, I didn't, I don't remember specifically any burning problems with the carbon black, however, um, I usually started off with a very low laser power and then moved it up to try to get the best possible spectrum. And in that case, we'd probably get the best possible spectrum before we'd start burning carbon black. Okay, thank you. I'm Ed Suzuki from the Washington State Crime Lab. And I wanted to know how you did your background corrections. Were you correcting for fluorescence or for the interference fringes caused by the notch filters? or both? Um, I believe it was mostly for fluorescence. It, basically, that's what, yeah, it was, it was basically for fluorescence. That's what we corrected for. I know that there's been, um, incidentally, you, for, you forgot to mention Genevieve as one of the uh, 
contributors, but I know that there's been a lot of talk about um, starting a uniform database for Raman spectra of pigments, which I think is an excellent idea. But one thing I think you should keep in mind is that you have to specify the excitation conditions, because if you have a lot of these were resonance Raman spectra, and it's going to be very dependent upon the laser frequency. Mm -hmm. So that's probably a parameter that should be included along with the data. And also if you do a white light correction. But thank you. It was real interesting. All right. Thank you. Um, Patrick Buzzini, West Virginia University. Uh, I would like to make a, a comment on more from a casework perspective. Um, you brought up some points that we have also observed, uh, typically pigments and spectra that we frequently uh, see because uh, the pigments are typically uh, very, very common. Uh, the example are the, the phthalocyanin. And I was thinking also for a case where, yes, sometimes you can identify the pigment and match typically between a question and then the known. Um, uh, to explain that, I sometimes, uh, some time ago, I had uh, a request uh, from a laboratory in Europe. Uh, they matched a question and, uh, and, uh, and a reference. Nice spectra, nice uh, identification. They asked me what uh, pigment is this. It was for a blue spray paint. And uh, uh, basically, I said, easy, it's aphthalocyanin. But um, the value in this case of this match is non, uh, there's no value. Why? Because we made some study, a typically population study, or a market study from the spray paints that basically all the blue spray paints on the market, every brand, every seller, are uh, provided this uh, spectrum. So one thing, I, uh, one thing that uh, from a criminalistic point of view we have to pay attention is typically, you know, uh, pay attention to this polymorphism because yes, if you have a match, you identify the pigment, but in this case the match has no, has no value. So. Uh, I just wanted to bring up this, uh, this point for, uh, from, from this perspective. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jamie Martin. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of available databases, one of which you can probably find on Amazon. Uh, some of you may remember the Nyquist uh, publication on IR and Raman spectra of inorganic compounds. That has a, a huge number of Raman spectra of inorganic and coordinate compounds in addition to assigning the Raman frequencies to specific vibration bands, which is really helpful. There's also an online database called the RRUF database. I think it's www.rruf.info. That contains thousands of Raman, XRF, and increasingly FTIR spectra of many minerals and other compounds. Uh, and the Raman spectra are often provided according to the orientation direction of the mineral. Um, Ed was good to point out the need to cite the excitation wavelength of the laser. I would also encourage, because many people in my area, which is museum work, also cite the power or the, 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 the intensity of the laser. We found that in looking at a lot of these pigments, we'll find that some pigments provide useful Raman spectra at a very low energy level, where others require a much higher, for example, half a milliwatt versus 14 milliwatts. And depending upon where you set that energy level, you may or may not get a useful uh, spectrum. Um, I teach IR with that at the academy, and it took me about two months to realize that Raman is a completely different technique than IR. It's pretty much analogous to taking a photograph. So you need to um, keep in mind your sort of f-stop and lighting conditions, et cetera. Um, further, there's also a recent publication and Spectroactima, uh, publication of 93 organic pigments that include um, spectra for those pigments, uh, assignations of peaks, and they've also developed a flow diagram for identification of each class of organic pigments. I don't have the full citation, but if you find my email address and email me, I'll either send you the citation or send you the article. It's fabulous. Sorry, I forgot to say something. Uh, those of you who know me know I can't shut up. But uh, <laughs> there's a recent paper in Applied Spectroscopy, in fact, a series of three papers where they did Raman on house paints. And they were looking at what they call lilac paint, um, 
colored paints. And I believe there is a pigment in there that was very common. I don't know if it was one of the ones you mentioned, but it's worth looking at those papers uh, because, uh, again, this was a pigment that was very common in this particular color. Skip Palinick from Microtrace. I just wanted to make just, just one point here, too. Remember that um, all this talk was really talking about was the Raman spectroscopy of, uh, of pigments. Uh, paint examination, forensic paint examination, whether for comparative purposes or trying to determine the manufacture and so forth, it's a far more complex subject. Raman, uh, infrared, uh, or Raman spectroscopy is simply one tool. Uh, there's as a chemical microscopist, of course, I believe strongly that you do as much as you can by light microscopy, first of all. And I tried to demonstrate at the workshop, in Chris's workshop the other day, what you can do with, uh, uh, with some other, other tools as well. But there is infrared spectroscopy, which, as Ed has pointed out in his paper, has shown the example in this oldest murder case in U.S. history he worked on years ago, infrared uh, of where they used uh, ferric ferrocyanide, Prussian blue. You can see a nice uh, uh, nitrile band in there. And uh, the information you get from uh, elemental analysis, not just sort of comparative, but also in looking at ratios of bromine to chlorine in the halogenation of, uh, of thalocyanins and things like this. There are a whole bunch of other things that can be done and should be done under the right circumstances in the right case. So Raman uh, microspectroscopy is simply one tool. And I want to just <laughs> make that clear. It's not, it's not an answer in itself. You saw a number of pigments that we simply didn't identify and that others haven't. Any other questions? Thank you.